Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Thank you all for joining us for today's episode of RF Breakthrough. My name is Megan Diamond, and I have the honor of being your host today. I'm a director on the Rockefeller Foundation's health team, where I lead our pathogen surveillance portfolio. In today's episode, Action on Climate, Emphasis on Equity, we'll have the opportunity to hear from an incredible group of women leaders who are creating change within their communities and around the world. The evidence is overwhelmingly clear. Climate change affects different groups of people disproportionately, often exacerbating existing social, economic, and environmental inequalities. From a global perspective, the world's 46 least developed countries are home to more than 1 billion people, but account for just 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Yet they bear the brunt of climate change with more destructive storms, floods and heat waves, and the downstream effects of those. Within countries, the situation is even worse for marginalized groups, such as ethnic and gender minorities, hindered by historical and systemic barriers that restrict access to resources and political power. Climate change is often called a threat multiplier. It only serves to amplify existing injustices and inequalities. As Thai activist Amacha Fornun put it, if you are invisible in everyday life, your needs will not be thought of, let alone addressed in a climate crisis. Yet, as is often the case, those who are most impacted by a challenge are the very ones who are most capable of developing successful solutions for it. They consider the complex social, cultural, and economic structures that drive oppressive conditions and generate ideas that are rooted in long-term change. With that in mind, in today's episode, we are thrilled to hear from a group of women leaders who are developing and supporting climate solutions and are putting equity at the center of their mission. And we all stand to benefit from these leaders. Studies have consistently shown that when women take the lead, disaster responses are more effective, governance is more inclusive, and outcomes are improved across the board. Women are more likely to start businesses focused on sustainability, in countries which elect female politicians are more likely to implement rigorous climate change policies. As the lead for our work on wastewater surveillance, I have seen firsthand the commitment, creativity, and bravery that women have when it comes to spearheading innovative new climate solutions. As a complement to this episode, I encourage you all to check out our, later, our latest Matter of Impact blog on the RF website, where you can read about how our colleagues from Bangladesh, South Africa, Tunisia, and Thailand are reimagining pathogen surveillance. Robust population health data is a cornerstone of understanding and responding to the health threat driven by climate change. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today's discussion. First, I'd like to welcome Dr. Rose Matiso. Rose is the research director for the Energy for Growth Hub, a global think tank researching and advocating for data-driven solutions to energy poverty. Her work focuses on energy transitions and emerging energy technologies in Africa. She is also the co-founder and former CEO of the Mawazo Institute, a Kenyan nonprofit dedicated to supporting the next generation of female scholars. Also joining us is Avra von der Zee, Avra is the Chief Operating Officer of Elemental Accelerator, a global nonprofit investing in climate tech with a focus on community impact. She has helped lead Elemental Accelerator to amass a portfolio of more than 150 companies. Her work in the impact investing space is helping make transformative technologies equitable and accessible. And finally, I'm happy to welcome Anya Schoolman, the Executive Director of Solar United Neighbors. Anya has decades of experience working in sustainable development. Under her leadership, Solar United Neighbors has helped spread solar power to thousands of households in the United States, and they've bolstered local economies through solar jobs along the way. Anya, Avra, Rose, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to everyone tuning into the live stream. Please join our conversation by commenting below or posting with the hashtag RFBreakthrough. Let's get started with the discussion. 
I'm going to, to open with you, Rose, um, and really build off some of the, the reflections that I shared in the opening remarks about how low and middle income countries bear the brunt of climate change, despite being least responsible for its causes. Could you elaborate on how the Energy Growth Hub defines an inclusive and equitable energy transition in this context? And talk us through what concrete steps your organization is taking to foster this transition and address the disparities faced by low and middle income countries. Um, yes, and thanks for having me, um, Megan. It's great to be um, part of this live stream. Yeah, so the Energy for Growth Hub, which is a global think tank that I'm a part of, you know, really central to all of our work is the role of development. A part centering our climate discourse, centering um, our discourse around energy transitions squarely on development. Because as you said, if you're vulnerable in day-to-day -day life with or without climate change, you know, natural shocks and disasters have existed from time immemorial. And for a very long time, many people have lived miserable lives because they're really on that bleeding edge um, and climate makes that worse. And so our main message is for many poor countries who have contributed least to the climate um, crisis and whose um, contributions will continue to be will continue to be really much on the edge, you know, uh, for you know for the foreseeable future, a lot of very poor countries are not going to be major emitters or anywhere close, collectively even, not even individually. And so, for those countries, what is important, what is central, is not a mitigation lens, so like a reducing emissions lens, which is what mm -hmm. rich countries and high emitting countries are focused on and should obviously be focused on. For poor countries, it's development and resilience. So how do you grow your economies? How do you create opportunities? How do you build resilience? How, you know, in the face of disasters, uh, if there's extreme heat, how do you access cooling? If there are floods, you know, do you need, what kind of infrastructural uh, changes do you need? And just, just reducing that baseline of poverty and that subsistence existence that make people interface so closely with the elements and with natural forces. Um, and, and, and for us, uh, what is a key enabler of that resilience, of that economic opportunity is energy. It's electricity that powers factories, that powers you know, office buildings um, uh, all over the world, uh, that power all sorts of economic opportunities. And in rich countries, you take that for granted. You know, um, Some of the stats we've thrown out just to illustrate this is, you know, a fridge in a rich country uses more electricity than an average person in a country like Kenya, Nigeria, major economies in Africa, or, you know, uh, video game players use more electricity in California than, you know, entire countries. Um, and so this is a kind of, um, this extreme energy poverty is, is not just, doesn't just have implications for quality of life. It also means that your economy cannot power the productive centers that give you jobs, that give you an income that enable you to lift your family out of poverty, that enable you to come out of this kind of subsistence edge living that makes you so vulnerable. And so the, the climate agenda in poor countries is really a development agenda. And that's really the message of the Energy for Growth Hub. Great. Thanks so much, Rose. I really like how, how you tease apart that um, the, the needs and the solutions are gonna be really different based on context. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll talk about this later, that this one size fits all for, for all the world, let alone an individual country, just doesn't make sense in the, this context if we wanna to get to, to where we know the world needs to be. I'm gonna go over to you, Avra, and build off this theme around equity, because I know that a big part of Elemental's Accelerator's mission is to embed equity in climate solutions. And one of the ways that you're doing this is by supporting founders and ventures that are usually excluded from traditional funding methods. And can you talk us through why take that stance and why is there this emphasis um, on, on diversity in terms of who you fund when it comes to climate change? And how have you seen this intentional approach pay off? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us. And thank you, Rose, also for the comments that ring so, so true for us at Elemental as well. So Elemental is a nonprofit. We invest in climate solutions with deep community impact. We invest across climate sectors and across geographies. So transportation, energy, building, circular economy, food, water, agriculture. 
And what we know from our 12 plus years of work is that the local communities that are disproportionately impacted by climate, as you said in the beginning, Megan, those are the, the those communities are the holders of the knowledge, the resources, the skills that will make the climate solution so successful or successful at all. So close to half of our portfolio are founders from traditionally excluded backgrounds. More than half of our of our companies that we've invested in report to serve low and moderate income communities. And we've learned over the years, learned from working on the ground in Hawaii, where we started, that you need to not only work with community partners, you also need to pay them for their expertise. Mm. This is the lesson that we have since applied across the US and the globe. And it's absolutely a business imperative. It's not just altruism. It makes the projects better. So over 93% of the elemental portfolio companies working with community-based partners say it's improved project success. By design, true local engagement will emphasize diversity, diversity in the founders, in the executive teams, in the communities that are being served, in the neighborhoods that are, you know, solutions are being deployed, and in the types of community partners that we're working with. As you said, the needs and the solutions, as Rose pointed out, right, the needs and the solutions are going to be by nature different depending on the context. So our portfolio companies have partnered in a wide variety of ways, for example, with a community college on workforce training programs, on training programs that um, train oil and gas workers on, on the you know, green economy, with trucking associations that host educational sessions to explain the benefits of electric vehicles, with native homestead groups in Hawaii looking for technologies that reduce utility bills, and more and more. And I think one of the things that excites me about the approach at Elemental is that we try to take a concept that can feel hard to navigate and vast, right? Lots, lots of different needs are, are at the table, lots of different communities, neighborhoods, towns. Um, lots of different problems are embedded in the sort of inequity of climate change. And we try to navigate to create rigorous and replicable, but customizable frameworks like best practices for working with community partners, like embedding diversity in investments, like in, you know, investing in um, solutions that are focused on community input first and foremost. That's great. Thanks so much, Avra. I really like how you talked about all the different solutions that might be needed uh, around the world. And, and again, coming back to that, there's not going to be one size fits all. And, and that success is really going to come from local community engagement. And I think that's a really nice transition to, to the work that Anya leads at Solar United Neighbors. It's an example of a, a really specific solution to address a really specific need. And, and your organization has helped connect more than 9,000 homes to solar panels. And I'd love if you could talk us through the relationship between solar energy and equity and how your organization has been growing to, to specifically reach low-income communities um, in, in the U.S. Sure. Thanks so much for the opportunity to talk. And I, I agree that the other speakers you know, set the table so well, mm -hmm. some of the big issues that I feel like we're grappling with every day. Uh, I'm the executive director of Seoul United Neighbors, and we are now a national nonprofit uh, that what we do is help people go solar. And our theory of change, we say, is go solar, join together, and then fight for your energy rights. Mm. And that we sort of figured out how to articulate it many years into the process. We didn't start with that theory. And I think that's kind of one of my main themes. Um, we started as a neighborhood project in Washington, DC. And it was actually my 12 year old son and his best friend Diego had seen the movie Inconvenient Truth. They were feeling despairing of their futures. And they said, we have to do something. The government's not going to help us. What can we do? Let's go solar. And we tried. And it was expensive and confusing and overwhelming. And so they formed something that was called the Mount Pleasant Solar Cooperative. And they started going door to door in our neighborhood. And uh, pretty soon we had about 50 households working together in one neighborhood to navigate the crazy policies and the utility and the companies and the technology. 
It took us two years. We had to pass a piece of legislation on the way, but we ended up taking 45 houses solar um, from 2007 to 2009. And from there, it's been kind of a contagion. It's been a natural movement where other communities saw what we did and said, can you show us how to do what you did? And that's embedded in the DNA of our organization, which is we don't tell people what to do, but if they want to go solar, we're here to help them, to hold their hands and support them through their process. Um, and in the very beginning, the, the motto or the saying that everybody was using was solar needs to be affordable and accessible for all. Again, that was our founding you know, motto. But over the years, as we sort of grew, added states, added people, professionalized this group purchasing pro process that we called the solar co-op, we started to realize that we weren't reaching everybody. It wasn't affordable and accessible to all. And there's two main sort of pathways that we went through when we started to confront that. And one was to develop community solar. So our initial intervention was be rooftop solar, so you had to have a house. So what about people who rent, live in apartments, you know, things like that? So we passed, we worked on legislation, so policy for community solar in DC, which has really become a huge model nationally of how you can make sort of solar accessible to anybody. Um, and then we started a series of pilot projects and all the way back to 2016 in Baltimore, where we were like, if you don't have the credit, if you don't have the money, you still should be able to save money with solar. So what are the problems? What are the models? And we decided even back then not to go into the work with a preconception about how to solve it, but really listen to the community members. And um, we were working with a charity that just helped people pay their bills. And we started to talk to them and said, well, what if instead of just paying people's electric bills, you bought them solar and then you would be, instead of them coming back every year, you'd be creating a long-term solution. Um, from there, we pivoted to DC uh, and ran a very large program for the city for DC. Again, based on a bill we helped pass. And then over the last four years, we've scaled nationally. And so we've run low income solar pilot projects across the country, Indianapolis, Phoenix, Tucson, rural Virginia, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Denver, Columbus. So it just keeps, again, the communities ask us to help them figure out how to do this. All of those were different models. And so what we've been doing is drawing the lessons from those. And then when the IRA was passed um, and they announced the Solar for All program, suddenly we had cities, counties, communities, NGO partners and states saying, how have you been doing this work? We now have $7 billion opportunity. Can you help us write the proposals? And so for the last year, that's what we've leaned into is helping to design and scale and apply the lessons learned. So it's it's an ongoing process. That's a the short way to say it. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I I think um this talking about how like it was around your son's I uh experiences, it really is a good reminder of the youth's role in climate change, in fighting against climate change, and really being part of the solution um, and, and the richness of the ideas that they have. Something that keeps coming up is this idea of localization and wanting um, the communities to come to the organizations with the needs or ideas, right? That we shouldn't as organizations go and prescribe a solution, but that that should, should come to us. And so I wanna go back to you, Rose, and, and based on your experience, what are some ideas um, around energy transition that have emerged from communities? And what makes these different? than the ones that we often hear about coming from the US or, or other Western contexts. Yeah, so it's so interesting. And I, I, I'm really enjoying listening to the co-panelists. It's all, all of these narratives are really building on to each other really nicely. And so 
I think to as a starting point to answer your question, I, actually, I'd like to reflect on all of the ways in which we share a lot in common, actually. And so often, because we've people who do more, you know, those of us who are kind of trying to elevate the voices of communities, we've had to lean so much into that, into that we're so different than we, um, uh, to, I guess, to Avra's point, that there's some generalize, generalizable mm-hmm. aspects and we have to find the right balance. And so yeah. sometimes I write, like to reflect on what everyone wants, right? Everyone wants a healthy, sustainable, prosperous life for them and their children. They want agency, you know, and these, I think it's, these are things that we all want for each other. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what's different is kind of the starting conditions, the constraints, the specific needs. And like, these are the, these, this is a texture that you need to get from the ground. And, and often um, communities, especially from underrepresented backgrounds or from poor countries that, you know, I mostly work with, like that, that texture is lost. Um, and, and that's mm. part of the problem. But then sometimes if we lean too much into we're so different, we're, we kind of are cut out of the, the narrative. And, you know, mm. and then there's a little bit of that ghettoization of development issues from just mm. our common humanity. So just to start from that, um, a, one example that jumps at me in terms of how um, common goals, totally different drivers uh, can come up. And this kind of um, connects to uh, Anya's point on this kind of fantastic journey with uh, Solar United is um, in African countries, actually, um, uh, there's a kind of a silent revolution of rooftop solar. Uh, this is actually work that uh, a fell, uh, there's a fantastic, uh, one of our fellows of the Energy for Growth Hub, who is based in Cape Town with Sustainable Energy Africa, which is a great nonprofit, and he works closely with folks at the University of Cape Town. They've been doing this work where basically there are all of these push and pull factors that are getting that are making people kind of yearn for democratization of energy with a totally different origin story than the story that Anya just shared. So for example, really unreliable, expensive energy in South Africa is a great case in point where the power sector is in crisis. And so people are being pushed into uh, rooftop solar, a lot of especially businesses, um, CNI and and this is kind of this organic upswell in response to those realities. And, and that's, in some sense, fantastic that people have this alternative. But then um, some of the work that we and um, our fellow Joel, Nana, and other colleagues are working on is you have to balance that with um, when you're building a ground up system of democratized solar that is not sitting on top of a robust grid network. Mm-hmm it's kind of out of necessity, you've been pushed into it. And so you're kind of achieving that common goal of sustainable energy that meets your needs and that you're know that you not subject to this kind of the vagaries of the kind of inept um, utility and, 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 you know, um, in South Africa, just cold, just terrible kind of coal system. So that's, so on one hand, this is a positive trend, but because people are being pushed into it, you know, and there's not this kind of system-wide, um, platform where you have a strong grid network that enables you to have the pieces of the edge come together um you know you have the the rooftop with the system all in harmony um can create a lot of problems it can increase mm. price you know so and so it's kind of trying to negotiate all of the ways in which different drivers are at work in different communities and in different um uh, in different parts of the world and so uh, uh this is just one example of why yeah. the texture is so important um, another example, and and then this, I know your question was for success stories, and I'm kind of cheating because I'm not. It's not a success story. It's just like just a, it's a real story. Are complex, yeah. <laughs> um, and great things are happening, but um, you know the journeys are different. Um, so another example is um, on uh, e-mobility in emerging markets like South South Africa, where I work, and this is another case in which in rich countries there's a big focus on passenger vehicles, you know, and you know, Tesla and like what, you know, and all of the majors like, you know, uh, Ford and whatever are like electrifying their fleets and how do you create incentives for people to buy cars that are electric and build the charging infrastructure. In Sub-Saharan Africa and um, developing Asia, actually a lot of the market potential is in two and three wheelers. So motorcycles and little three wheeler taxis. And so um, that's another example of where um, common goal around e-mobility, around uh, cleaning up our transportation system, not just for climate, but for health. Air pollution is a big, mm. big factor. But then what that revolution will look like 
in particular geographies is totally different and the drivers are completely different because transportation mm -hmm. needs and trends are different and so um i think the the sec that we're still getting it right in terms of how to adapt those narratives and to understand mm. how the drivers are complex and we have to kind of ride the wave but also try and create some structure around it great thanks so much rose for for adding that layer of depth uh, so that it, it's not presented as just an either or um, situation for solutions but it's a lot more complicated and interwoven than that and I, I'm curious just to pivot off what you said, um, Avra, just from your perspective, right, as an investor, when you hear about um, the opportunities, but the complexities tied, tied behind them, you know, from the investor side, how do you tackle that and make sure that you're um, identifying solutions that have the most potential for positive impact and scale? It's such a great question. And it's one that we're constantly asking ourselves because as soon as you have what you think is a framework to follow, you'll need to adapt it, right? You know, the only thing that's constant is change as we know. So when we're looking to make investments, we have a, you know, we have criteria we look at in terms of GHG impact, in terms of community impact. We also interview our portfolio companies. They uh, uh, present projects or the applicants present projects their vision of how we can support them um, and where they wanna deploy the technology within a community, with government partners, with other stakeholders. And what we realize is there's both a, you know, planfulness and it, but also an intention. So sometimes uh, when we're evaluating whether to make an investment in a project, not all the community stakeholders will be identified. And that's actually an area we can, we can work with a, um, a company to help them identify the most impactful um, stakeholders and community members and community groups that will add that texture and that nuance and help identify problems as so, so well articulated by Rose, right? Um, and sometimes the, the applicant will come to us with a very uh, well enumerated and baked approach. And we have other areas where we can add value in terms of policy support or a particular aspect of a workforce development plan. So again, it's about meeting a portfolio company where they are, but knowing that the intention is there, knowing that there's a framework that they hope to follow, that they're eager to work with an investor who prioritizes development work, who prioritizes community engagement, and we do our homework, right? We we diligence our companies both for GHG impact and financial and, and financial diligence, and but also for you know how have they been? How have they been with community partners they've worked with to date? Uh, we interview them at length. We interview folks they've worked with. Um, so we're looking for not just what what sounds good on paper, but mm. from our experience, what we know could potentially work and what what has been demonstrated in action by by these leaders and we are never um you know a const um, constantly being reminded of you know the human ingenuity of some of our our CEOs and executive teams the reality is is that scaling a company is very hard that delivering solutions to real people in real places is challenging and it's challenging for innumerable reasons. And so many of our, our, our founders are women, many of them are, as I mentioned, traditionally excluded talent. Across the board, I'm forever impressed by the sort of ingenuity and um, determination of trying to figure out solutions that work for the locations where they're being deployed. And it is not for the faint of heart. Great, thanks, uh, Avery. I think you really highlighted in your answer what makes Elemental's approach so unique. How you, it's very holistic, and and you look at all these different elements, the the ones that are traditionally assessed, but also um, prioritizing things uh, around whether they engage with the community or, or what their intention is. And it really makes the organization stand out. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, um, Avra, is around this framework, using a framework to follow. And I want to use that to, to pivot to Anya and, and, and talk through what others could take away from your experience at Solar United Neighbors in terms of if they have a solution and it, they want it to grow into a movement and they want to impact policy, 
what are some of the best practices that you would recommend to them when pursuing that mission? That's a really hard question. <laughs> what Amber was talking about, how hard scaling is, I was feeling yeah. it itself. So um, I think there's a couple of things. I, I think my, my biggest is start before you figure it out. Mm. So all through school, we're taught, you know, think it through, think it through, have your plan, write it up, you know, do all that brain work first. And I think in the real world, whether it's a for-profit or a non-profit, you actually have to be there doing the work and then be learning those lessons and build those into your plan. Mm. And um, one of the things that really has come up with, with Sun is we we have a whole policy arm and we organize people for policy work. And I described before a little bit about the community solar work. We also worked really hard on the IRA with, with support from Rockefeller Foundation on what needed to be in the IRA. But that yeah. stuff came up in our from our projects. So like one of the big things that's in the IRA is called direct pay. And direct pay just means that nonprofits or government agencies, churches, schools, municipalities can take the tax credit that's available for the private sector and get a check from the IRS. And that was one of the main things we pushed for, but it came out of our work. It came out of helping dozens of churches try to go solar and how complex and convoluted. So our whole policy agenda is built from the barriers that we bump into mm. rather than coming from an analytical framework. Mm. And I think that's very back, very inverse to the way we're trained in school. Mm. Um, and I, they, it really came home to me um, once when my son was still really young. He, he's so he started this project when he was twelve, at about fifteen. He he's a scientist now. He's a physicist, um, and that's the way he thinks in a very orderly. Fat. And a journalist from um, I think it was the BBC interviewed him about the project, and they said, "What was the biggest thing you learned?" And I was like, oh, what's he going to say? I had no idea. And he said, he said, you don't have to know what you're doing before you start. Mm -hmm. And that just mm -hmm. blew me I away. That. I mean, and then I was like, that's it. And that's sort of the whole thing in a nutshell. So yeah, I think that's, I could name a bunch of other ones, but I think that's, that's the great. most important one. Yeah, I think that's really, really powerful. Start before you figure it out. And especially because we can't, predict the future, right? And we just have to keep moving and adapting um, and, and new opportunities come up when you do that and new challenges will as well, but there's only so much you can control and starting is one thing you can. So that, that's great advice. Going more into this, this policy lens, Rose, I wanna go to you and, and talk a little bit about data and how important it is for informing policy decisions. So can you talk us through what the, the data landscape is for around energy and energy transition and Africa and, and how we could all collectively play a larger role in producing more data and advocating um, for the power of data? Yeah, and, and this is actually work that Rockefeller is kind of uh, has been drawn to. I think in general seems to be drawn to the the mm. nerdier, dark, darker topics that nobody's really mm -hmm. the unsexy <laughs> topics that you know nobody's kind of yeah. gunning for data. Yeah. <laughs> but I know you guys have supported a uh, really incredible data work. But yeah, you know, I just think um, we need to we need to kind of understand the problems we're facing. So we need some vocabulary to define the problem. Um, we need some vocabulary to um, kind of scope possible solutions to experiment, test them, and then to see how we're doing and iterate and kind of course correct, right? And so data is instrumental to that. And, and actually, when I said vocabulary, I, I was quite intentional because actually some of this data is not just hard numbers, it's perspectives, it's, it's voices, you, people's lived experiences. You need some way to collect these, this information. Um, and, 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 and obviously some of this information is really kind of traditional data sets. So in the energy sector, for example, like if you live in the US, 
there's the Energy Information Agency, this massive um, uh, agency, you know, that is dedicated to collecting energy data. You can go on their website and you find you can find any information about energy, anything mm. in the U.S. And they also do some global work. It's just rich data. And so if you are designing policies or if you're a researcher studying um, energy topics or even if, if you're running a, 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 an energy startup, you can just at your fingertips, you can figure out like what is energy demand, consumption, trends, just on your and, and so this doesn't exist in most poor countries. Uh, this is really mature energy statistical systems are really the you know uh, are really um, uh, this is something that happens in rich countries. And so mm. many poor countries can't even produce like regular energy statistics, just an annual digest. This doesn't. And so this kind of basic energy statistical function is really important. Uh, right now, there's a lot of um, buzz around, obviously. AI and big data and synthetic data sets and what we're getting from the satellites and all that is really cool, but it really has to sit on top of national statistics mm -hmm. capabilities. And these are some of the details that get lost um, in the buzz that like, um, well, we think about data, we need the basics. So we just need statistical agencies. And that's talk about like eyes glazing over nobody. That's not <laughs> interesting. And then and then we need to also expand our understanding of what the information is and data is. And that's where the really community, like that's kind of where you are like finding ways to hear from communities, their challenges. And this is exactly what Anya and Eva were talking about. That's really vital information. And sometimes people who might get the statistics challenge don't get this broader information. And then the third bit is obviously leveraging all the ways that technology is helping us fill data gaps. So like, for example, um, we're getting a lot of mileage out of satellite data so we can fill in. So in, for example, weather, weather prediction, climate disaster prediction, we're getting a lot from satellite data that is making up for the lack of ground stations, meteorological mm -hmm. ground stations. It doesn't, doesn't cancel out the need for it. And so, you know, you, you need granular data to kind of, to, to, um, to get the most out of satellite data, but acknowledging that the technological things we can do to fill data gaps. And then mm -hmm. the last thing is, data in action right so data is not just in a vacuum it's part of this iterative problem solving and so you need these policy making uh data information interfaces or you know whoever is using this information needs to have this kind of iterative approach and i think something that i love that my colleague Kate, katie off of the energy for growth hub always says is that the energy transition is it's not a destination it's a journey and it's this mm. kind of like meandering random work where you're adjusting to new information, new factors, new players, new perspectives, and 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 data is this kind of rich, uh, in, it's, it's this broader kind of class of information that helps us get a handle uh, of those, like what are our problems, what are our goals, what are possible solutions, how do we experiment them, are the experiments working? Um, and, and, and so this is super crucial, otherwise you're left with these generic prescriptions that don't mean anything and we have kind of decades of failed development agendas to that serve us prove of that yeah thanks so much rose I appreciate the reflection on how the satellite data is meant to be complementary and additive but not a replacement uh, of national statistics or other um, baseline data that should exist and i think in the wastewater surveillance world, uh, this is often how we how we think about um, the data coming from wastewater. It's never going to replace clinical data. It's not meant to replace clinical data. It's meant to be a complement and to help fill gaps and help drive insights. And so I think that that messaging translates to a lot of different contexts. Um, I know we have some audience questions. And so I'm gonna to pivot to the first one, which is, um, from an audience participant named Fiona. And her question, um, which I'm going to um, send to Abra, is around financing. That's why <laughs> it's going to you. And it says, how can we ensure that women and girls in women's rights organizations, who we know are delivering adaptation activities on the front line of crisis, are able to access the climate finance they need to deliver their important activities. 
Thanks, Megan. It is such a great question from Fiona. Um, it is a question that's top of mind at Elemental. We are always evaluating where are there gaps in funding, where is there gaps, mismatches between funding opportunities and organizations and, and technologies on the ground delivering impact. You can't uh, fix what you can't when you, what you can't measure to the data point that Rose is making, right? So I think the first the first aspect of, of any question is is I if you can identifying the gaps and highlighting those gaps. Um, and I think one of the one of the aspects of this question that's that's so interesting is this focus on adaptation and the need to highlight these activities, um, the activities that are happening on the ground in communities. One of the um, one of the things I heard when I was in DC a few weeks ago, we had our first ever sort of DC Innovation Week, where we were bringing together uh, private sector leaders and and the government. Um, and we were lucky enough to have Gina McCarthy, who's such a climate champion, kick off with opening remarks. And you know, she for, for, I'm sure most most folks know who she is, but her career is so uh, varied. She was a public servant with both the Democratic and the Republican administrations. She was leading health advocate and environmental advocate. She's also just an amazing person to listen to. Um, and what she said to this group of business leaders who were feeling a little bit timid about sharing their stories was, you know, don't be timid that your story doesn't matter. You have a good story because it's your story. It's your story to tell. And I think one of the goals at Elemental is to elevate stories and solutions on what's working and highlight some of the inequities and the mismatch in terms of opportunities to share what where they exist, to map the, that sort of ecosystem of opportunity. The beautiful thing about philanthropy is that it's a powerful and essential part of the solution. And we know firsthand how it enables us to move quickly to 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 make investments, to be innovative, to create fi new financial tools, but also new frameworks, and to invest in the highest impact projects. So in terms of you know how how to create access to climate fi finance, I think it's continue to tell the story, continue to tap into the power of philanthropy, uh, continue to share the the gaps you see so that philanthropy can move help, organizations move into those gaps, move into the edge of where others are in investing. Great. Thank you. And our next audience question is from Christine. And Christine said, girls are disproportionately impacted by climate change, but continue to receive a very small slice of funding. How can the wider philanthropic space effectively influence donors to support more youth-led and girl-led climate action work around the world. Um, and I wanna add on to, to Christine's question and, and ask Anya and Rose to reflect for how, and, and share how they've been able to garner funding for their work and what type of messaging and approaches have enabled them to be successful in raising funding for their work. And so we'll start um, with you, Anya, and then go to Rose. I don't know how to educate funders. That is a something I do all day, and I <laughs> I have no advice to give on that. Just be honest and tell your story and figure out what they're trying to do. You know, like because funders have goals. Yes. Yes. So you have to figure out what their goal is, and then see how what you're doing is intersecting with that. Um, so I don't think I have a lot. Uh, to say about it, I I I think that um, getting the kids in very tactile ways is really essential. And I I guess I just wanted to share one thing that we invented at Solar United Neighbors a lot, uh, many years ago that's still going strong for the U.S. market, which is a solar patch for Girl Scouts. Hmm. And we don't even promote it. And we've had, I, I just asked for the number today. We have 4,173 Girl Scouts have done our solar patch and they you, they go on and there's a curriculum and it's sort of the first step towards becoming an activist in their community around clean energy, but it gives them the building blocks and the basic vocabulary to start. So yeah, it, it's just one of the things that we do hmm. to try to address that in a concrete way. 
but I bet Rose has much better things to explain on this topic than I do. I don't know if I do. I think for funders, and not to put you, Megan, on the spot. <laughs> it's my job. You're, you're a tough lot to decipher. But, you know, I, what I something that, especially if you're doing community work or work with, you know, that doesn't translate as well to, you know, this is our, these are like how we've crunched the numbers. Like to, to Anya's point that there's an analytical, super like well-baked theory of change at the beginning. I think this is something that um, can be a struggle and many funders, even funders in the philanthropic space who ostensibly like this is your mission area, um, sometimes have co-opted too much that really over analytical, over kind of, uh, you know, business-y kind of direct pathway we can predict what will happen. And I mm -hmm. think that that can be difficult for like, as Anya said, when you're starting out and you're kind of learning from the ground as you go and you have a hunch. And a, a concrete example of that is when I co-founded this organization, Mawazo Institute, you know, we just knew the theory of change is that, you know, um, women have ideas. It can be only men have ideas. And yet all of the researchers, experts, thought leaders on development issues are men. And um, an important pathway to be an expert and a thought leader is through the academic path, you know, an academic career. So mm -hmm. uh, getting an advanced degree, writing, doing research, you know, often the heads of like big development organizations are super credentialed. You don't have to be credentialed, but this is kind of a common pathway. And so the, the, the intuition was that we need more women in that pipeline, in that kind of credentialing expert pipeline. And... <laughs> it's it's uh, we have some data to prove it we can say like women are missing or whatever but it's also you know um it's not an easy pitch to sell because they're like oh you're, you're getting you're helping women kind of do their phd research or does that like how many that doesn't scale to the stratosphere like mm. we can't say that way uh you know a million women <laughs> in a year will be reached yep. it's it's very you know it's a different theory of change and i think all i could point to was look at me somebody invested in me mm -hmm. right somebody I am somebody who is the outcome of this theory of change that because of this investment in my education, in my trajectory, I am now the only African woman in the room and I'm having a big influence. And so I think that that, that got me somewhere that I mm -hmm. was able to, when you have kind of a nebulous, kind of semi-nebulous theory of change, like I was able to point that out, but it's still a challenge. And so maybe my, 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 my intervention is not so much to give the solution, but to ask um funders who might be listening that there's that yeah. sometimes the way that they fund even in philanthropy can be so restrictive and doesn't capture this kind of more meandering paths that are super influential um really quickly on the second piece about how to support more women and girls and i found completely striking the examples that you gave anya which are like working through the girl scouts creating curricula over and over, all I hear are these are structural interventions. So you are interven intervening at the level of institutions, right? And so I think sometimes people want, and, and I love the grassroots, and you know, uh, but I think we've kind of lost focus on these the inf institutional infrastructure through which you can reach young people. So schools, for example. So we need vibrant schools that you can dock in your solar curriculum or your solar outreach and that kids are getting excited and exposed. You need these up these um, extracurricular organizations like the Girl Scouts or robot, robotics camps or you know all of these things that um, kids in privileged um, neighborhoods might get, but you know that are being gutted. And so what I would say is we need to start thinking more structurally around the grassroots, mm. that their institutions, like Ensola United is an example, and even Elemental is an example of a structural, <laughs> a pretty structural intervention that is reaching the grassroots and that, that we've kind of neglected those structures, whether it's our schools, our after school organizations, whatever, and that more needs to be done to invest in those institutions. And related to that is um, in the energy world, for example, I have colleagues who are. Um, working on this new exciting project to explore a society of feminist energy. And it's just thinking about what kind of energy future creates economic opportunities for women. And there's a lot of great work um, that we're building on that is all, all uh, focused on community enterprises. And that's really, really good. But then really trying to raise that to the structural level, to the macroeconomy wide level, like what does an economy, economy look like? 
that has opportunities for women. And so that we're not always really narrowing our aperture to this lens of the one off here and there. And, you know, that we're really thinking about the institutions that deliver resources and um, platforms for women and girls, whether it's the Girl Scouts or whether it's, you know, now there's like a massive call center in your town that's powered with reliable electricity. And now you have a job outside of the home and everything in between. Great. Thanks so much for, for answering both my question that I just threw on to the audience question and the audience uh, question as well. And I appreciate the open dialogue about the challenges of working with donors. I come from academia. Um, I spent most of my career trying to find money in, in places <laughs> and mostly being unsuccessful. And here mm -hmm. I am uh, in philanthropy and just want to reflect on some of the things that you said that that donors need to be flexible, right? Um, we just heard from Avra how you can't have everything sorted uh, when you begin. You have to things develop in real time. You need an idea in a roadmap, and then you go from there. And donors need to to respect that process and invest in that process. And I also heard that donors need to to redefine how we think about metrics, and that it isn't necessarily about quantitative metrics, that it's also about uh, qualitative metrics and things that can't be quantified in any which way at all. Um, and that can be through capturing stories um, and, and other type of, of more diverse types of data um, that show impact and that we're not used to doing. Um, and then Third is that we need to be accountable for creating the opportunities, right? We need to give out funding that is targeted um, towards uh, underserved communities, taking inspiration from, from each of you and your stories and the work that you do in support um, in, in recognizing that that's where impact is going to happen is when we uh, invest in strong, strong organizations and strong individuals. Um, and with that, Right. I'll say thank you. Thank you so much to, to Rose, Anya, and Avra for this conversation, for being so open and in sharing your, your stories of leadership and the obstacles that you've had to overcome. And the I hear optimism in, in your voices because uh, there isn't much of a choice than to just keep just keep going and just keep trying when it comes to, to climate change and climate action. So you've you're a real inspiration um, to the Rockefeller Foundation in our community. And it's a real privilege to have had this hour with you. So thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate everything and, and looking forward to, to seeing your stories further evolve. And thank you again for joining us on this episode of RF Breakthrough. We invite you to join this discussion by commenting below or using the hashtag RF Breakthrough. And be sure to check out our latest issue of Matter of Impact, which features our panels from today and other inspirational women at the forefront of climate action. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.